Hello, and welcome to First in Future. I'm Leslie Boney, Director of the Institute for Emerging Issues at NC State University. On this show, we talk with people who are imagining the future of North Carolina, and we ask them to look around the corner and tell us what we need to be doing to prepare for the future. Now, we do this with some humility. It was Yogi Berra who once said, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. Peter Drucker once said, trying to predict the future is like driving down a country road in the middle of the night with no lights on looking out the back window. So, we understand that it is difficult, but we also know that it's important. And our guest today, Ted Abernathy, has never backed down from doing the impossible. Ted Abernathy, welcome. Thank you. But with that uh, intro, I'm not sure I've got much to say about it, so we'll see. <laughs> Ted is the managing partner for Economic Leadership, LLC, which we'll say more about in just a minute. But I wanted to start off asking about Dallas, North Carolina, where you grew up as the son of one of the two most famous people from Dallas at the time. Uh, yes, my dad played Major League Baseball, and uh, Bill Friday was the most famous person uh, by a long shot, but uh, I was lucky enough to grow up there. My family's been in Gaston County for about 10 generations, so I got to grow up in a small town in North Carolina uh, and spent my time partly in Dallas, partly in Stanley where my grandparents had a big farm and uh, it, was a, it was a great life growing up there. We got to spend the summers in big cities back when baseball players didn't make any money and uh, spent our time in Atlanta and Chicago and Cincinnati and then came home every uh, year and went to school in Dallas and uh, formed my life. First time I came across the name of Ted Abernathy was when I bought a Topps baseball card in 1968 and saw a picture of this pitcher for the Cincinnati Reds who the year before had been 6-3 and three, but more importantly had a 1.27 earned run average which next to Bob Gibson was about as amazing as any pitcher could, could do at that time. Yeah, he, uh, he was fireman of the year a couple times, best reliever in baseball in the 60s, quite proud of him. Uh, and if two years later, he was playing with Bob Gibson and with the Cardinals, so uh, good, good analogy. Yeah. Um, did you grow up feeling like you were in a shadow, or was he away enough that you were able to have a childhood without being in the spotlight? Well, we traveled uh, with him all the time, uh, but my dad was a, he was a big country boy, 6'5", six, you know, six at a time when nobody was 6'5", uh, and we always described him as the quietest man on earth. He never said much. and. Uh, so the shadow wasn't like that. Uh, it was uh, it was just uh, something a little different. And uh, you're a kid, so he retired when I was 14. About the time he was retiring, I was starting to have some, you know, coherent thoughts, and, and maybe was enjoying it a little bit. But uh, when you're a kid, you're just traveling around, and then coming home, and uh, you know, harvesting sweet potatoes in the fall, and going to school, and that was mostly life. Yeah. You took those coherent thoughts and got them a little more coherent at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, mm -hmm. then got a master's at Johns Hopkins after that. Yeah, my, uh, my parents were pretty clear that I was going to be the first person in our family to go to college, and uh, so there was never any doubt that that was sort of the pathway that was going to happen. And uh, I, even though I went to UNC, I wore my red tie for you today with, uh, with <laughs> NC you. State. Uh, but uh, no, I, had, uh, I was lucky in North Carolina to attend one of the, one of the great state uh, sponsored universities in the country and then found, found out I didn't know quite enough yet and uh, sort of continued up at Johns Hopkins before I went to work for the city of Baltimore. You had two really high profile jobs, um, both of which were based in North Carolina where I really got to know you first as COO of the Research Triangle Regional Partnership which does economic development thinking for a swath of the central part of North Carolina, mm -hmm. and then as executive director for the Southern Growth Policies Board, which thinks about economic development policy and other things across the southern states. Yeah, the, uh, it was, uh, I started out locally, I uh, was the economic development director for Orange County and then for Durham City. Uh, and then when I went to RTRP, it was right at the time that we were first starting to think about cluster analysis. So not to geek out, but trying to figure out what we needed to spend our time on for the future. That was back around 2000. Uh, and had, had a good time there, spent about eight years. It was a great time in the, in the early 2000s. The, the region grew a lot. We started putting in the, the roots for the informatics cluster that now you see Fidelity and Deutsche Bank and Credit Suisse and all these companies are built on 
uh, the infectious disease cluster, which I don't think anybody would go out and talk about that too much, except that this region is one of the great regions for that, clean tech, other things that were starting to emerge. We were moving out of uh, the old hardware cluster. You know, we, we used to make cell phones here and hardware and other things. And so that change was part of what RTRP was helping lead at that time. Uh, and then I, I guess uh, just being a lifelong geek, I ended up uh, going to Southern Growth and, and trying to do a little bit of that looking ahead all across the South for, uh, for 13 states and got to work with a lot of really dynamic governors that were trying to see how the South was transitioning to a, to a new future that wasn't built on the same things that we were built on once before. So now with your consulting firm, you work with associations, with regions, with states, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm wondering how this package of things that you've had in your life, growing up in a small town, working for a pretty big urban region, and then working with the entire South, how that informs the work that you do and the advice that you give your clients. Well, uh, the small town stuff never leaves you. My mom's still there and my whole family's still in, uh, in Gaston County. And so when you go home, uh, you get to hear firsthand what the, what the challenges are for people that live in less urban areas. Now, Dallas is a lot closer to Charlotte than it used to be, mostly because Charlotte keeps growing. Dallas is uh, still growing just a little. Uh, but that always keeps you understanding what the rural parts of the state are dealing with. So we've done a lot of work in rural North Carolina. We've also done a lot of work for the uh, Delta Regional Authority in, in rural parts of Mississippi Delta. So that informs it. What we try to do as a company is look at data big complex data, turn it into information that people can use. And so we spend a lot of time doing data sets and then a lot of time looking at trend analysis. What is it that's actually changing out there? Because we really believe that communities that are going to be successful are going to be intentional. And I think part of that is learned by North Carolina. Uh, North Carolina has a long history of seeing the future, whether that was building a community college system because they understood uh, skill training or building a biotech center or MCNC because they saw emerging clusters. There's a whole series of things that North Carolina has always had to do because we didn't start out as a rich state. You know, we were the we were that valley of humility between the you know, mountains of conceit and Charleston and Norfolk and those rich Virginia and South Carolina places. Uh, North Carolina always had to figure out where it needed to go and it had to be intentional doing it. So what we try to do is help communities see what they can do, what it is, you know, you've got to look at their assets, you've got to look at the weaknesses. Uh, in today's world, data dominates a lot of that. So consultants know that data before they ever consider a place. So we're trying to help people understand that. And I think I'm, I'm a product, I think everybody's a product of where they come from. And uh, I think I'm no different than that. Here are two things that sound contradictory that I think I've learned over the past few years. Uh, the first is that every place you go is unique. And the other thing is that every place you go has a lot in common with other places. Yeah. And I'm wondering how you balance that when you're talking to places that have a great deal of pride in yeah. where they've come from and who they are, but you're traveling all over the South and you're seeing many common things. So how, you, how do you stitch yeah. together those two things? So I agree completely that every place is unique, but every place is also in context with the rest of the world. So the fact that uh, you have unique assets in a place doesn't mean that you can ignore what's going on around you. So in a world where overwhelming trends around technological advancement and globalized business and urbanization and all these other trends, they're real and uh, they impact you and you can't ignore them. So if, if you're you know, in Manio, North Carolina, uh, you're very unique. I mean, you're, you know, your position's unique, your workforce is unique, your assets and your weaknesses are unique. And your accent is unique. And your accent is very <laughs> unique uh, and, uh, uh, and your beauty's unbelievable. But the world is still a place where younger people are choosing more often, especially more educated young people, to live in large urban areas where businesses have to connect to the world in order to be competitive. Where your individuals, when they graduate high school, that's the beginning of a lifelong set of skill advancements that they have to have in order to continue to progress. So yes, you're unique, but you have to understand the context you're in. We talk about it as 
you know, you're, you're floating down the river and what you do in the raft makes a lot of difference. But the river's gonna take you whether you do something or not. So being intentional is probably what keeps you from getting into too much trouble on that river. Right. As you look at North Carolina, particularly, well, just tell me your travel schedule over the past couple of weeks. Where have you been? We talked about this ahead of time, so it's a softball, but uh, I, I've been in uh, South Carolina and Georgia and Mississippi, uh, Missouri, Arkansas, and Kentucky uh, in the last two weeks. And uh, we try to do work in a lot of southern places. Uh, I do do, I'm going to Washington State in a couple of weeks. Uh, we're doing work in Kenya. I mean, there are some other places, but I prefer to stay in the south because I feel more at home there. And so uh, it's pretty, you know, this time of year, it's pretty good uh, travel schedule. So given this perspective, I'm wondering what you would say about North Carolina's job situation right now. Where are we? How do we stack up with other southern states and maybe nationally? Uh, so in the last year or so, North Carolina uh, job growth has been sort of upper middle part of the country. In the south, uh, Georgia's growing a little faster, Florida's growing a little faster. But places like West Virginia and Oklahoma and Louisiana that are uh, energy based are actually losing jobs. So we're in pretty good position there. It, you know, when you start measuring the economy, it's about what you measure. So uh, we're one of those places that lots of people are moving. We're in one of the top six base states in the country for in migration. So we're growing and you, you can't get seduced by the jobs that are created by growth. Uh, you know, everybody who moves here ends up buying a house, going to the doctor, going to the grocery store. Those are jobs that are population growth. So you have to look at the traded jobs. And when you look at jobs that bring money from the outside in, we're, we're better than average, but we're not at the top yet. Uh, when you look at gross domestic product, we're above average, but not near the top of the group. Uh, incomes have not risen as fast. So there's positives and negatives. We are certainly one of the best states uh, in the country for business climate these days, and that's tax and regulation and those kind of things. Uh, middle of the road when it comes to workforce and, uh, and infrastructure, which are the other two major things that people look at. So uh, one of the things that we talk to clients about and we, we talk to legislators and policymakers about is that you can always find a good number and a bad number. And we tend to argue about a single good number and a single bad number. Uh, but when people start making decisions, they make it on a whole group of numbers that are complex. And so uh, North Carolina doing better than average. I uh, obviously love my home state a lot, uh, but we have always had to work real hard to stay competitive and we have to in the future too. So what's the good number, good news narrative? Let's say someone called you in and said, Ted, tell me the good news about North Carolina. Where are we? What are we doing well? Uh, business climate, real, real good. Uh, like I said, the tax regulatory system, uh, legal systems, those kind of things, we get rated top 10 across the board. And so when people are looking at those type of uh, figures, they think North Carolina is good. Uh, when you look at quality of life issues, many of them look really good. and. Uh, we've always known that North Carolina was a great place to live and, and work and the beaches are pretty and the mountains are great and you know, all those things. Uh, I think that when we, when we look forward, what we can see is that we've got a good group of businesses. We're pretty good in some, in some growing areas. Uh, that's dominated by our metro areas and, uh, and our metros include more than just Charlotte and Raleigh and Durham these days. I mean, Asheville's doing pretty well and Wilmington's doing pretty well. Uh, but it's uneven and everybody knows that and I'm sure you can ask me a question because that we talk about public policy issues in the country. Urban rural divides is one of the two. Skills gap is the other that everybody wants to talk about these days. Uh, but North Carolina is positioned well economically. You know, good fund balance, pretty good retirement benefit. We don't have any of those big ticket items like a Kentucky has or a Illinois has or something else that really are problematic going forward. But, uh, you know, we, it's not a time to be complacent in North Carolina. There's a lot of work still to do. We're imagining where we need to go in the future. I was looking at a recent report you'd done, and one of the things you highlighted is our relative uh, lack of strength in the export area. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what you think we might be able to do about that if we were trying to increase the number of exports. Is that an, do we do that through the air or do we do that through the ports or how do we you do, do that? Uh, so we've grown, exports have grown about 20% over the last group of years and that's middle of the road again. 
Uh, we don't have one of the major ports, deep water ports, uh, but we do have two pretty good international airports. And I think we've figured out that we have to make some investments and strengthen our ports. Part of exports is how the products are that you have. So your economy here, North Carolina's manufacturing economy is about 20% of our state GDP. That's one of the highest in the South, so it's still important. Uh, but what we make isn't as exported as much as some what other people make. Uh, I think part of that is just building a, a stronger uh, export mentality among our businesses. When you think about it, a state that's growing as fast as our state's growing, sometimes the markets are there and you don't have to work quite as hard to find those new markets. But I don't think that globalization is going to go backwards anytime soon. We're in an uncertain time in, in global politics these days. But uh, when you look at the movement of money and people and products, they've been pretty much growing now for about 100 years. and so. Uh, there might be a little hiccup, but they're going to continue to grow. North Carolina needs to strengthen its ability to, uh, to grow uh, what it exports. Now, we're really good at foreign direct investment. So foreign companies are moving here. They like us, and that's a big uh, open door to try to build on that export. The Institute for Emerging Issues last year did something we called the Disruption Index, and it was a county-level look at what's happening with regard to automation and what the danger to North Carolina's jobs economy is from jobs not necessarily leaving due to globalization but leaving due to automation. Right. And I'm wondering as, and we found that it was uneven throughout the state so mm -hmm. that there are some, the, the stronger, bigger urban areas are slightly less vulnerable than some of the areas that are heavily dependent on service economy or tourism or rural areas. Sure. And I'm wondering what your advice would be for someone growing up in Dallas now. It's a middle schooler. Yes. You were talking to their parents or to the, the young person there. What skills would you say that person needs in order to be resilient in the coming economy? Well, we try, when we look at skills, and we do a lot of workforce uh, work in our company, uh, we try to look at groups of skills. So the first one is a foundational knowledge group of skills. So this is what our K-12 system is teaching you. So you're going to have to have a basic uh, proficiency in reading and comprehension and mathematics. You're going to have to have the life skills that everybody talks about. You're going to have to be responsible and honest and all those fun things. Uh, past that, you're going to have to have a set of work skills around communication and team building and problem solving that are transferable between jobs. And analytics has become more part of that. People have More people have to deal with numbers than used to. Uh, but going forward, I think the future skills are around integration with automation. Uh, the people who can use that automation to their advantage, to their productivity, are going to do better. Cross-cultural competencies, the ability to manage multiple priorities. Uh, what I would encourage people to do today is try to go ahead and commit when you're an eighth grader, recognizing that as an eighth grader you won't remember this the next day. But go ahead and commit that you're going to have to be retrained your whole life. It isn't something that in, in our grandparents' age, they would learn a skill and they'd retire 30 years later or 40 years later with that skill. And in our life, that skill is going to be obsolete in 10 years. Rather, you know, the basic ones, no, but your, your general skills are going to be obsolete. You're going to have to teach yourself or be taught or, have, or Google or go back to a community college or whatever it is. You have to do that throughout your life. And so the commitment early on to be inquisitive, to be intellectually agile, uh, to want to know more every day is going to be there. And that's hard. That's hard. I don't think people traditionally believe that uh, they're going to have to spend their whole life learning. But as an eighth grader, let's go ahead and get them started thinking that way. Uh, but just generally uh, learned how to deal with people and learn how to deal with numbers and learn how to deal with machines. And you'll be better off. We're just concluding a contest at the Institute for Emerging Issues where we asked people to d draw the superhero of the future, and we called this person the versatilian. The versatilian, okay. It was someone who was going to be able to do that lifelong learning you're talking about. Yeah, uh, I, I can't draw, so that would be a problem for me, but yes. Uh, it's already over. You don't have a chance. Oh, to good, end. good. Uh, well. Uh, Sorry. Uh, I, you know, I think that it's funny because we talk about general knowledge being more important 
every day and specific knowledge. So we used to talk a little bit about T's, you know, the, the idea that you know a little bit about everything, a whole lot about one thing. And I think in the future, it's where it's, it's more ease. So you have to know a little bit about a bunch of things and it's how they come together that creates real value for you as an individual or for an employer. That's a good thought. Um, we have five questions that we like to ask guests, okay. and it's sort of a lightning round, although it doesn't normally move at the pace of pace lightning. Of lightning. Okay. Um, first question, what's the most important thing that North Carolina needs to be working on over the next couple of years in order to position ourselves for the future? Uh, the, sh the short answer is, is the skills of employees and, uh, and the infrastructure to move goods and ideas. But a little past that, I'd, I'd go and say that I think we need to get back in touch with the people of North Carolina. We just finished a project for the Kettering Foundation on uh, citizen democracy, having uh, forums all across the South on what citizens were thinking. And there's a lot of angst out there that uh, citizens don't know what to expect going forward. And I think that if we spent the next couple of years getting back in touch with our communities, with our citizens, trying to understand North Carolina didn't get to where it is today by trying to emulate some other state or some other best practice. People, people always say, what's, who's doing it well? What's the best practice? But imitation can be limiting. And so I think that if we can get back to the ideas of our citizens, that's where I'd focus for the next couple years. I think it'll make everybody feel a little better about the future. And when they're, they're less concerned about it, they'll probably be more productive. All right, what's our long-term play? What do we need to be focused on over the next 20 years in order to really fully position ourselves for an yeah. uncertain future? So we're going to grow, and uh, with that growth comes a real demand on infrastructure. And infrastructure is a challenge all across the country because nobody knows how to pay for it. So how do we have the airports, the ports, the roads, the broadband, the water, the sewer, the waste disposal? Uh, we need a commitment back. We started some of that last year in the legislature, but there's there's a real need. If we're going to grow, and this state is expecting to grow, then we're going to have to put a lot of time, energy, and eventually money into infrastructure. What's a book you would recommend that North Carolinians read to be ready for the future? So two things, two books. So one is The Complacent Class, which I'm about three quarters of the way through. It's a Tyler Cowan book about how some of our fear of the future has caused us to, to have less dynamism in our economy. We're sort of sitting back trying to, trying to protect what we have. And uh, you know, in a, in a capitalist world with, a, with entrepreneurship, that doesn't always work. So the complacent class. And the other is a book called Progress. Uh, it's Johan Norberg's book. And it's, um, we, we tend to think today, oh, the world's, oh, everything's terrible. Uh, he took a look at where we've come as a society in this world over the last 50 years and with health and lifelong longevity and environmental things and all sorts of the standards of living, we've made a ton of progress, more than we've ever made in the history of man in the last 50, 70 years. And I think people need to understand that we were intentional doing that and we've made great progress. So as we go forward, those two. Who's somebody that we might not have heard of right now who 20 years from now in North Carolina is going to be doing something amazing? Yeah, so we probably haven't heard of them, so I'll start with that. <laughs> but uh, I'll give you an example. Um, I've got one nephew, uh, and he uh, went to School of Science and Math and, and went to Highland Tech in Gaston County and then School of Science and Math and uh, eventually went out of state, went to Virginia Tech, and uh, then ended up on the Rio Grande and the the in the Mexican border towns doing Teach for America. He's coming back to law school uh, this coming year and he's the type of kid at 22 who wants to change the world. The question for us in North Carolina is there's a story in every family of those kids. Are they going to come to North Carolina? Are they going to be back here? Uh, and are they going to help us change the future? So. Uh, I'm trying to get Roy to want to come back this way, and I think that there's a, a kid everywhere that's in their 20s that are going to do that. They're, you know, in 20 years, the, the, the smart answer would be to say it's going to be some nine-year-old who's going to invent the next thing that cures the world, and we just don't know who their name is yet. Last question. If North Carolina could pick its own position on a baseball team going forward, what position should we play? Uh, you should play manager always because you get to <laughs> you get to decide what happens uh, for the future. So if you're on the field, uh, catcher because they control more of the game than anything else. Uh, I I I want my state 
to lead. I don't want them to follow. I don't want them to try to emulate somebody else. I want them, uh, the state to work. I want things like the Emerging Issues Institute to help us figure out where we need to go because uh, as a state, we need to be ourselves and we need to lead other states. And uh, so uh, let's, let's be the place on the field that uh, other people have to follow their direction. Ted Abernathy, Managing Partner for Economic Leadership, LLC. Thank you for being with us. Thanks, Liz. I appreciate it. That's our show. Our state can do amazing things, but if we want to control our future, all of us need to be thinking about new ways that we can help shape it. I'm Leslie Boney from the Institute for Emerging Issues at NC State. We'll see you in the future. North Carolina Channel is made possible by the financial contributions of viewers like you who support the UNC-TV network.